and welcome to 21 Conversations, the 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. I am Paula Pierce, one of the board members of Greensboro Literary Organization. Greensboro Bound is so excited to present to you these 21 Conversations, our effort to create something unique and special for our community within the confines of our continued virtual environment. 21 Conversations plays homage to North Carolina's rich literary history while broadening our tent to welcome in voices from outside our own microcosm of experience. This featured presentation is but a taste of the 52 authors that we have gathered together in a series of delightful, sometimes unexpected, but always edifying conversations. Since our inception, Greensboro Bound has been committed to providing programs like the one you are about to watch, 100% free to our community. In order to do that, we need the financial support, both big and small, of readers just like you. Please support Greensboro Bound by giving now. The text to give phone number, as well as our website are on your screen. A sustaining gift of just $15 a month or the cost of a single children's book will help us remain financially solvent throughout the year. I also want to take a moment to thank our sustaining supporters without whom Greensboro Bound would not be possible. Our utmost gratitude to the Edward M. Armfield Senior Foundation, the Roof Lands Memorial Fund, and Arts Greensboro for their support continued belief in our vision to bring together readers and writers of all genres, ages, ethnicities, identities, and voices to foster an understanding of writing, a process that allows free expression, deepens critical thought, and helps sustain a culture of inquiry and delight that is open to all. Thank you again for joining us for the 21 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Please enjoy the conversation. Awesome. It's so nice to meet you all. Um, just, just so you know who I am, I'm one of the booksellers at Skepperdown. So I will be gladly hype teaming both your books <laughs> throughout the spring and summer because I really, really enjoyed them both. Um, just wanted to give an intro to the people that are listening in, um, but we've got Lisa Crossmith, whose book This Close to OK. Um, she's also a homemaker, a writer, a mother of two, um, and her newest title, it, it just traverses this level of grief that I really just thought was so powerful um, and centers on, you know, a, a therapist who crosses paths with a man who is about to jump off the bridge. So, you know, time is of the essence. And then we have Naima. Um, her novel, What's Mine and Yours, is, it's funny, like, I feel like both your books are kindred spirits, but their time is just so, it's so different. You have one weekend, and then you have, like, decades, um, but your book, Naima, was just so, it was just so lovely, and um, uh, it, it's, both of them have crossed paths, but yours is crossed paths over a series of decades where they kind of come in and out, and it's all about the integration of a, of a public school and a county school, and how parents, both the parents of the two main characters kind of integrate with each other. So yeah, I'm really excited to talk with you both. Um, the thing that really like stuck with me um, is that your books do feel like kindred spirits. Like I, I could imagine both characters in both your books like hanging out with each other. And did you feel like if there was like a universe where they both live that they would hang out with each other? If so, you know, which ones? You're, you're asking if I feel like our books would hang out. Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Naima and I have been hanging out a lot 
and, yeah. and, it, and it happened it happened back in 2018 too so so I'm I'm more than okay with that e- even if our books were vastly different um I I don't mind at all that the universe brings us together as often as as it does because I love listening to her and I love her work so um but um yeah I, I can totally get what you're saying the a book not focused on um on all white people a book focused on family and how to make a life, a book focused on um, people trying to push through the hardest things that have ever happened to them. I mean, those are, those are core things I think in, um, in both of our books. And um, I think that they both deal with women who, um, and people just in general who are flawed and, and, and um, in some ways that they know and some ways that they don't realize that other people may realize too so I definitely think there's a lot there's a lot there and there there's an orange on our covers yeah. and they're yeah. put out the same imprint. <laughs> so they're put out they're put out with the same imprint about a, you know a month apart so yeah I think there's definitely a lot a lot there for sure yeah I could see like Noelle and Tally you know being friends like I could see them having coffee together you know and they're both like these very perfectly imperfect characters but I'm still I'm rooting for both of them but they're they're right they feel so real um and that kind of brings up another thing is just the perspective of these especially with Emmett and especially with Lacey May like they're both coming from standpoints that I think would be really difficult to capture because one is Emmett's suicidal and then Lacey May has this perspective on things that's really upsetting you know like the way that she's choosing to react to the integration of the high school was it hard for you to um get through the writing of those like I'm wondering about the process of of capturing those characters that aren't necessarily I can imagine not very fun to write you know but you do it so well so I can speak I can start with that um you know it's interesting I didn't find it hard to write Lacey May perhaps because I chose to create a character with her views. I was really interested in rendering this woman who we understand as vulnerable and frustrated. Her husband struggles with addiction and he's in and out of her life and she's trying to raise her three girls and she wants to make sure that they have a good future. And I think that that is something that feels admirable until you learn more, um, which is that she wants to hoard opportunity for her girls and she chooses to oppose the integration effort that you mentioned. And in doing so, she is standing in the way of a friendship that her daughter really wants to have with this young man named G, who's a sensitive, anxious young black boy who's brought into the school that's being integrated. And so, you know, Lacey May is a character who has lots of dimensions and they don't cancel each other out. You know, like the fact that she loves her daughter doesn't mean that her stance is harmful and grounded on racist ideas. They're both true. Um, And so I'm interested in that complexity because I think that it's that complexity that helps us see ourselves. Yeah, and I think the structure of the book is interesting um, because Lacey May gets a really large part of the book, you know, and um, I think that gives you some time to really mull over her and give her that empathy that you're not really expecting to give her, but you do eventually by the end of it, like you can, you can understand like where some of that woundedness in her comes out in her actions. Yeah, I mean, I think this might be something that our books have in common. I wonder what you think, Lisa, is there can be sort of empathy for characters without approval of their choices um, and without suggesting that there's a better, or there's still a suggestion that there's a better way. And I think in this Close to OK, both characters, but maybe especially Emmett, finds that there's a better way than the way that he's been living. Yeah, I, I, I do, I do totally agree with that. And I would, in terms of just empathy, yeah, a, a mother just trying to keep her family warm. And I don't have to agree with the woman. I don't have to have anything in common with her at all, but I can understand. <laughs> like <laughs> like I, everyone can understand that a, a mother trying to keep her babies warm. So um, yeah, when it comes to, I, I didn't really have any difficulty writing any characters in, um, 
and this close to okay. I mean, um, she has a, Tally has an ex husband who could really be terrible. She can't have children, and and he he has a mistress, and he gets his mistress pregnant, and you know, like a month after, um, he's divorced from Tally. He marries his mistress, and it could be the kind of thing to where you could just make him a villain and hate him. But I really grew to love him too, even if I was right, you know, even while I was writing him. Um, I, I always, I grow to love all of my characters in a way, or I can't sit down and, you know, really talk about it. And then I also feel like for me, it helps me create a well-rounded character who jumps off the page. Um, if they're difficult, I love difficult women. I love complicated people. I, I love writing characters who do unexpected things. And so with both Tally and Emma, I have them keep secrets from each other through the course of the book. They're not telling everyone, they're not telling each other everything. Um, and I slowly unravel some of that to the reader. Some of it we still don't, you know, we don't figure out to the end, but um, that made it really exciting for me because bit by bit, they're getting to know each other the readers getting to know them too and um the wilder more difficult the character um the wilder just you know if they make like a wild decision or do something unexpected the more i really really love the character both when i'm writing and also when i'm reading mm. i agree with you on that one that is did you find yourself um going into this with a certain idea of how it was going to go. And then it, it went in a very different direction. Like as you wrote, you found out more and more like, oh, this is where these people are supposed to go and what they're supposed to feel and experience. Um, with anything I write, it's a little bit of both. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm a, I'm a planner when it comes to some aspects of it. So especially, you know, on the business side of publishing, when I'm trying to sell a book, I'm um, obviously a planner obviously I'm having I'm having to tell my agent and editor what the book is about you know literally from a to z in order to sell yeah. it but then when it's mine again when I have it to write it and finish it yeah I am very surprised by all kinds of things side stories and characters and stuff like that so it's both for me um and this is not um, a very pleasing answer to people who are searching for something concrete but there is a little bit of magic in everything I write that I cannot explain I can sit down and the, the characters, things come out that I haven't planned. The characters just come alive for me. And it's almost like if there could be some sort of um, illustration or some sort of cartoon that would come when I sit down at the laptop where I'm, you know, the laptop where I'm doing, where I'm writing, it, it's almost like they just come to life out of the key. Like that's mm -hmm. what happens for me. So I cannot explain it. It's not something I could teach someone how to do. It's not something that I can fully, you know, unfold when I'm trying to explain it, it really is magic um, for me. And that doesn't mean I'm not doing the work. I'm sitting down and I'm writing for eight, 12 hours a day. I'm obviously sitting there and doing it, but there is a bit of magic involved that, um, I really try not to talk about too much because I love it and I keep it. Um, but that that also does happen. Um, that happens for me for sure. And that's, I can't imagine getting to the end of a long project like this without having that little bit of magic. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think sitting there is half the battle. You know, like you're there, you're yeah. paying attention. You're, you're putting in the time. I think a lot of people right. think if you sit down it immediately comes out, but it's, I mean, it's eight to 12 no. hours. It's not that at all. Like, <laughs> is not how it works I appreciate you kind of like demystifying that because it's it is magic but it's magic that you put a lot of work into there you, you know? go absolutely so, yeah yeah well, yeah it's interesting I relate to what you said Lisa like I think a lot about discipline and technique and craft but there is something that happens yeah that is beyond all that and all of that creates space for the unconscious or I like Lisa's experience of magic. Um, I'm also a planner, but there's no way that I can know what the novel contains fully before I start. Um, and there is a process of discovery for me and redoing the plans and so much that changes over the course of the process. Yeah, I, I feel like that's when I know I'm reading a good book is when I feel like the author, I can tell when the author had fun with it. I can tell when they kind of like lost themselves in it. And I feel like that's true. Both these books are just, for me, it's, there's a lot of, you know, books that are really satisfying because they're formulaic and you feel comfort when they end a certain way, but you're actually, both of yours end in a way where I'm like, 
I'm satisfied, but it wasn't how I thought I would feel like in both right. ways. Like, I, and I think, um, interestingly enough, they both end on this motherhood, um, aspect that I wanted to ask about it and, and how motherhood guides both, um, Noel and Tally to their own satisfying endings. And if that had anything to do with any, um, things you discovered along the way in your own experiences. Well, I'm really interested in how a person's dreams morph over the course of their life. Um, you know, our dreams for our lives get interrupted and have to be remade. And, you know, for my character, Noel, who's Lacey May's eldest, um, we see her as a child in the book. And we also see her as an adult and she's more like her mother than maybe she expected she would be in her stubbornness um, and her self-righteousness, but also in her desire for a family of her own. And there are all kinds of obstacles that she faces um, in that journey to motherhood. And so I was interested in giving her some sort of fulfillment of her dream, but like sideways, like differently than she um, expected it to be. And I think that that's true for many of my characters. Like they might be longing to connect with their mother and they don't get that they get to connect with a surrogate mother or they you know might be looking to belong at home and then they don't get that but they get to belong at school in the production of a play and I think that that's sort of true to my life certainly um that there's that like bittersweetness of um getting what you need but it's not always in the form that you long for yeah and I feel like there's a way that they healed a wound of sorts with creating their own family in the way that they, you know, maybe didn't expect, but ended up making in the way that they needed to for both of them. Like, I feel like they, you know, get to experience the, the love and the affection and the um, empathy you get from motherhood. I don't know. It felt very satisfying for me, but it wasn't like, oh, they became mothers and everything became better. Like it just, it was more than that. It was like oh, a lot more depth than you see with kind of like a Shakespearean ending, like everyone's married and everyone's good. Like, so I really appreciated that yeah. perspective on it. Yeah, me too. And also um, I would add for this close to okay that um, the adding to what Naima said about your dreams coming true a little crookedly or um, you know, what happens when they morph or when they do change. Um, Tally cannot have children. She wanted to have a baby with her with her husband um that's what she wanted to do that that was her plan that was their plan and that when that didn't happen um she makes other plans and i think that the plans that someone can make explains a lot about the person they've become or the person that they're forced to be or even the person they want to be that i want to be the kind of person who can handle this and you kind of fake it until you make it and and, and tally um had big dreams for this it was something that she wanted and then it all fell apart not just in a way it would have been hard enough for her to not have a child of her own with her husband and for them to have to make other plans but the fact that he goes and has a baby with another woman. So it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. Um, and I gave her a lot because I knew that I could have her handle it. And because it's just realistic. Sometimes when one bad things, one bad thing happens, then five bad things happen. And the way that a person handles those things, it says a lot about who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also have Emmett who, you know, through the course of the, no through, through the course of the novel, we find out what brought him to the bridge's edge. Like why is he wanting to take his life? But even that decision for him um, is a certain person makes that decision or on that day, a lot of times for, su for people who are dealing with suicidal thoughts, it can be impulsive, it can be planned. It, you know, it, you, you never really know. And so, so for him, he also is having to deal with the loss of dreams and the loss of what he thought his world was going to be. And, you know, frankly, that sucks. Now, what do I do? I don't know how to deal with, can someone help me? I don't know if I want help. And so it, it really is like, it really does get complicated and, you know, just depending on the characters and just depending on where the story goes. But um, that's what I love to do when I'm sitting down um, to read, like you were saying earlier, Mackenzie, I love being, um, just totally immersed like I love that feeling of reading a book and then looking up and remembering where you are yeah um, and, 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 and it's like with Naima's book 
too especially um i feel like you get to know the characters so well you are kind of like in that fog you know no characters are thrown away you get to be fully immersed in their lives and so when it switches to another one you're like oh okay now we're going to someone else but it's in that way you get to grow with them and get to like really know them and so when i read naima's book i did kind of read it in that days and then look up and be like oh you know, and then you kind of just want to read it again, knowing what you know. And those are my favorite, you know, knowing what you know now when you get to look back on it, like those are my favorite books. Yeah, I feel like with both your books, I wanted to like go from the beginning again to make sure I didn't miss any. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that's the fun of it is you're like, you both dull things out and these little like, you're like, okay, here's a little treat, here's a little <laughs> treat, you know? And then you get to the end and you're like, I got to go back. Now that I know, you know, I have to, you know, connect all the dots. So I just, I thought that was really cool, especially both structures are so different. Was there, um, mm -hmm. was there ever a decision made where you were like, this is the structure of the book, you know, like either, you know, Italian Emmett going back and forth or, you know, with Lacey May, I, I don't know how you did it, Naima. I would have been, the fact that it goes through time and, and with people, I, I don't even know where you start with that. So I'm wondering if there was a point where you were like, this is the structure or, had played around with other ways of telling the story? Well, I'm curious to hear Lisa's answer to this because one of the things that I loved about this Close to Okay was that feeling of suspension that you get from this like intimate weekend with this these characters for the bulk of the book, not for all of the book, but for the bulk of it. I feel like that only deepened my experience of being in a special contained experience like they're sort of trying to escape their lives and aren't able to fully and so I was in that escape with them and I love that so I don't know if you want to start Lisa oh well thanks for your sweetness always yeah I um I did not wrestle with the structure of this book and I say that up front because I always wrestle with the structure of my books it's the hardest thing for me uh, just point blank the, the, the hardest thing for me to do is figure out how I want to structure the book, but I did not have that issue with this close to okay. So um, it came really nat. So that part of it came really naturally. I knew I wanted to hear from both of them, and so just you know, I'll do th I'll do some things when I'm writing. Like I'll actually literally count the pages of you know the chapters. I'll have it weighted. Um, so the percentage of Tally's mm. point of view is just a tiny bit more than Emmett's in the book. So I will actually do the math there to see that you know there's eleven you know eleven chapters to her page, then twelve or thirteen chapters. It I I will do that kind of thing, but it comes really naturally for me but my first novel on whiskey and ribbons yeah it took me literally years um years to figure out how to structure the book um and I ended up writing it as a piece of music as a fugue because um they've lost someone and and then I was reading about a fugue and it's three voices and two voice and, and then one voice drops out and two voices are left and I had three people and one of them was killed um, and so there will only be two voices left. And that was re a really magical thing that that clicked for me. In the meantime, I was walking three, four miles a day, just walking, listening um, to my computer, you know, to my phone, read it back or listening to the playlist, mm. like trying to figure it out. Um, so it's usually really hard for me. This was really easy for me. Um, but also... I didn't have as many main characters as Naima. There were just two people and like we were saying at, at home um, kind of chatting. And so that wasn't, that was really easy. I made it easy on myself because it's just like they can talk that part of it, they can talk back and forth. But what I love so much about What's Mine and Yours is that we had almost, it could have been sort of like a, a fuzziness and then a focusing, but from the very beginning, I just am, you know, once again, I don't want to make it like some magical thing. I'm, I'm trying to be. Do it. Make it, make it magic. <laughs> but it magic, but the thing, <laughs> but when you trust a writer and you're trusting what they're doing, that's why it's like, I love whatever form they want to give it mm. to me in. It's mm. like, you know, if you give someone ingredients for, and they can make a cake and they can make bread and they can make, like, I trust mm. you to make what you want to make for me. And so when I sat down reading it, I'm trusting Naima to tell me the story she wait, the way she wants to tell me. And I get really frustrated when people like, they won't read books written in first person, or they won't read books if it has different points of view. And I'm like, how can you not take the art the way the artist wants to give it to you? I trust they know the way they want to tell the story. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also 
I have good taste. So when I'm reading something, it's good and I'm going to pick it up and it's going to be good because I have good taste in the things that I've chosen. And so, I, I mean, I'm just, that's not magical. That's just fact. So, so, so when I'm, so when I'm experiencing that from any sort of art, like I am appreciating what's happening. And so, you know, I know Naima has talked about it being a mosaic and, it, and, and that's what I love about it so much because that's the only way that you can get to know these people and see how they're going to come together and to be patient and see how that happens, trusting the writer and knowing that it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think what's fun about both is you, you, the word that kept coming up to mind when I read both books is I felt like the perspective and the, how it's structured only added to how misunderstood each of them can feel and how that misunderstanding, you know, takes them apart, but then puts them back together. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's oh, interesting. No, it's oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was saying that's key. I just think that's key to both the books. Yeah, I mean, I think we have so many assumptions about storytelling or structure that lead us astray. Sort of like if a book has a big cast like mine, it's gonna be confusing or it'll be thin and the characters won't be deep. Or if a book is intimate, like Lisa's, it won't also contain big ideas and right. a sense of history, right? And it's just not true, um, no. you know? As, and as writers, like we've got our eyes on these things, which doesn't mean like I always nail it. Um, but I think part of it has to do with also how we make assumptions about certain kinds of stories, right? Like first person is always more intimate and right. immediate, right? Which I don't find to be true at all um and then you know for what's mine and yours like sometimes my answer to the like how did you keep everyone straight question is like oh I had a lot of documents on my computer which is true like I had a lot of documents on my computer um but I I think it's you know what Lisa was speaking to before which is like something that is like sort of like beyond craft whether that's like attachment to these characters a way that they live in me like something in my unconscious that like helps me know them and know their vulnerabilities and I think it can feel hard to write about that side of writing because we have like whole industries set up to kind of like capitalize on the teaching of writing and I do think writing can be taught and I teach writing but also like there are things that happen in the writing process and the reading process I think that are like mystical and you know and are not just down to like I thought a lot about similes right you know? yeah I I um I used to work in publishing and there's just so much that gets lost in the gulf between writing the book and then the actual publishing of the book and I think it is that ownership of like this story is exactly how I'm going to make it and I'm going to steadfast I'm going to hold you know tight onto what this book means to me, you know, I think if you enjoy reading it, that's the whole point. Like if you're writing it for someone else, it's probably not going to be good. Like, that's always what I tell people that are like, I want to publish a book. I want to do this. I'm like, well, who are you writing it for? Did you have fun? And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, you should go back and do it when it's fun. You know, like, I just feel right. like there's a lot that you can't, you can teach a lot and you can tell a lot of people about the business, but I think as long as it, it, it shows that you both enjoyed the writing of this and it shows that you had fun figuring out that structure and how that all comes together, so. Yeah, and I, I would also add, you know, I'm really staunch and defiant about the fact that my books are books. Um, they're meant to be read. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that may sound wild, but what I, what I mean is it's not a movie. It's not a short little skit. And, and when people, you know, when I see, I don't really read reviews, I'm not interested in them at all, but, but when people, you know, occasionally when I see them about other books and people will be like, oh, it, you know, this was hard or this was confusing. I'm like, it's a book. I don't know how to tell, like, I don't know how to tell you how to read a book. Like if you read a lot of classics, you'll get 40 pages in and be like, I don't know who's who, but read the book. Like you have to read the book. And if you need to flip back, you have to flip back. I defiantly am writing a book. If someone, enjoys reading books mm. um then they will learn how to read a book and to patiently wait you know to patiently it's like you read middle march it's like a thousand pages long i didn't know what was going on until i got to page like 
600. And then I'd be like, who is that? I can't remember, but it's just like, that's a book. It's not a movie. It's not a half hour skit. Mm -hmm. And I talked to my agent about this often, you know, because, you know, when I was trying to sell um, my books before, you know, it's a quiet book, kind of like the kiss of death in a lot in publishing. I didn't care about that. I'm never going to change my art for the business or for the publishing side of it. I can't do it. I would die inside. My art is so important to me. I'm going to do what I want, period. If someone wants to buy it, if someone wants to read it, that's great. If they don't, that's fine too. I have to live with myself. And God is the only person who matters in terms of how he's feeling about me. (laughs) So it's like, that Mm. part I really push back against if I even hear it it doesn't have to be about my book at all Mm. but if it you know it's like the people who read and then they go on goodreads and they hate every book they read I'm thinking they just don't enjoy reading Mm. um they don't like books they have never found a book they like that would be miserable I would just move on if you're like listening to music in your life and you've never heard a song you liked you (laughs) don't like music (laughs) <laughs> um, if you've never seen a film you like, then maybe you don't like movies and that's okay. There's lots of things like I do not like watermelon at all. So I just don't eat it. It's like, <laughs> it's, not complicated. <laughs> it's, not, it's not, and it's like, I get, I get really like in, I, I was talking about this the other day at another event because I felt like, because of, you know, the, the moderator was talking about books and people, you know, they get, you know, they slowly get to figure this out when they read a book. And I was like, yeah, that's a book. That's the magic of a book. You got to pick it up. If you don't read it and you don't understand what's going on, then, then maybe you're not, a. maybe we need to practice more or maybe books aren't your thing. I don't know. It's not my job. There's billions of books. Find another one, write your own. They're just so many different. They're They're just so many many. different. I, I think, I think especially when you can review literally everything, it's, <laughs> everyone loves to be a critic. And I think mm-hmm. also the people that wish that they could write books sure. love to be a critic, you sure, know, sure, because they, sure. I mean, that's there's some, you know, we don't have to get into like the psychoanalyzing right. of it, but it's there. It's clear. You know, you can tell from reviews and stuff like that. Like, I feel like every book that comes into being is like a blessing. I'm like, <laughs> like you just gave birth like you gave birth basically yeah. I think of it in the same way <laughs> but yeah I I've, people forget that like art is a suspension of disbelief mm, you know right. when you go see a play you're in that world you're not going to be like it doesn't look like my world so I don't get it you know I think I think sure. that's a gulf that people need to understand is is why would you do it if you didn't want to get that suspension of disbelief that's so satisfying you know like why wouldn't you willingly want to enter into that you know for 200 300 pages so yeah I don't think people are necessarily going to get that because I (laughs) know this is the book selling me coming out but like I don't care if they get it like so it's like and this always happens to me like this is um one of my last events for for this first leg of my book tour and it's always at my last event where you know I kind of (laughs) drop that whole whatever and I'm tired and I've been doing a lot of these so then so then you get the you know which would normally take me like I don't know if I drank a a glass of wine or I would have to be three thirty in the morning glass of wine while (laughs) (laughs) but it's like I don't I don't need that by the time I get to the end of these so I'm like Mm -hmm. no it's a book if you don't want to read it don't okay I I can't explain a book to change and I want your definition to be the definition of book in the dictionary now (laughs) but yeah it's it's not that complicated and I feel like the beauty of reading and writing is that it's self-selective you're going to find the right people that want to read your book you're going to find the right editors and the right agents that want to champion your book you know it, it starts from the very beginning down so I'll also say that I I think a lot about how much I bring to the reading experience, sort of like to go back to what Lisa said about like, if you don't like watermelon, like maybe that's about like your palate and not like watermelon (laughs) itself. Um, But you know, like I, I think of reading as like contact between at least two minds, you know, and they're going to be things that resonate or that don't. And like readers bring so much to the experience that also shapes the meaning of the book, you know? And so I try to have an awareness of that for like when I don't like a book, what it is, or when I love a book, right? It's not that like that book is a triumph or that book is a failure. It's also like, what did I bring with me 
in my response that made me love it or made me question or unsettled it, you know? And so I think that that's also something that makes books special Mm -hmm. um, is that it's like about this relationship, even if the people aren't in the room together, at least that's how I feel. I like to think of myself as in relationship with the authors that I read. I totally agree with that. And I think it, that comes up a lot when you like give a book to someone, you're like, this book means a lot to me and they don't get it. And you're like, okay, all right, let me, uh, man, that stinks. Don't get um, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, but then you don't get me, you know, like, <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Here? You know, but I, I do think, um, I don't know, the point of reading is to transport yourself. And if you don't get it, sometimes you have to, I think a lot of people don't observe how a book might make them feel uncomfortable or it might be unfamiliar and why you know so I just Mm -hmm. I I think we're getting to that point maybe but this is the bookseller in me that's just like very wishful thinking that people (laughs) so yeah I'll Ooh. okay so this is just I'm just curious what if any, were there any books that you read in the writing of your own books that either just kind of like bolstered you or inspired you, or even just, you know, took you out of the writing for just a minute when you needed to take a break? Mm -hmm. Um, I read two different books just to think about structure and neither book gave me a structure for what's mine and yours, but they gave me some space to think about how other writers put together books that move in all kinds of ways through time and that are made up of different parts in something like a mosaic. So I read A Visit from the Goons, I reread A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan, which I love. Um, And it's much more a mosaic than my book. Like it has like a PowerPoint presentation, a journalistic (laughs) article in there, but I loved it. And I read it to like, see like how a book can hold together through theme and through asking questions and answering questions and how a character can transform even if you're not straightforwardly following them through time. And then I also read The Dew Breaker by Edwidge Danticat, which some people would call a novel, some people might call it interconnected short stories that follows different people living in Brooklyn and in Haiti who are all affected by violence under the dictatorship over many years. And those books are both wonderful. I'd read them before and I reread them and they, if nothing else, gave me like permission and like some stuff to kick around to, to think about what's mine and yours. Yeah. It's kind of like, this is what a book can be. Like, I love when you get those reading experiences. Like I read, um, one of my favorite books from last year was Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Everesto. And it's, It's like one long, like interconnected poem, but it's also like a Greek chorus. And I, it's just, I like, I didn't know a book could be like this. Like, this is, this is so fun. I didn't know it could take on this structure. So it's fun when you find one of those. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, I don't read a lot of literary fiction once I am actually writing on, um, act actively working on the book. Um, I would read like a bunch of thrillers for, um, started working on this close to okay actively working on it I, I can't even remember that like I just re- like um you know on my kindle I would read one and then like it would be like try reading this one and I would read that one too which I don't really do I don't really like just devour books that the uh, you know algorithm throws at me but I was just I originally when I started writing it I wanted to make sure it had those elements of a thriller something I'd never written before and something that wow. I don't yeah, I don't read a lot of, of those at all. So I was sort of devouring those in the beginning because I knew I wanted some elements of that. I needed some elements of that. Um, and so that's what had me started exactly, you know, the way I did um, starts the moment she sees him about to jump and she, she stops him, you know, instead of starting, she's on her way home from the gym. So it's not starting at the gym. It's not starting, you know, with her just being like, la di da it starts with her, you know, being like, hey, stop. Um, and so that, that did inform the way that I, uh, you know, um, approach the beginning of it and the way I was withholding secrets and the, the measuring of the secrets out like that. Um, but um, just in general, like I love Jane Austen. I love the Brontes. I read a lot of, um, I, read, I read a lot of books like that, books from way back. Um, I just love the classics for, um, for just their very quiet, patient storytelling, you know, that I'm staunch about. That's, that's what interests me. Um, Mm. books and characters you get to know fully 
Um, I'm not trying to write a book or any books where, uh, oh, it's just like, uh, you know, I just flew through it in two seconds and then you just devour it and you want to pick up another one. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on um, mm. art and books that can 10 years from now be read. Um, and, and I think the push, a lot of that too, and that's a longer conversation, but the push is from this social media, these clickbait, these by, and that yeah. is the beauty of a book. You can't get that from a book. I saw some wild thing that was like, oh, how to quickly, some guy was talking about how like, how to quickly devour a book. And it was like, you can listen to the audio book at, you know, three times, and, you know, three times speed. And While you can doing just- jumping jacks. I don't like that. <laughs> and, and I didn't know if it was a joke but like it's like I have no idea whether it was a joke or not but it was just this idea of like how you can devour books and I feel like that happens too when people are like I read 100 books 200 books this year but I'm like I just mm. I just aggressively reject that I love the idea of a book it and who cares how long it takes you to read it it took you a month because you're busy and you have life you know what I mean it took you two months it took you three months or it took you three weeks it's like that that doesn't matter to me it's you can experience it on your own you can carry it around in your bag you can keep it by your nightstand like I'm really like hardcore about those things obviously because I keep <laughs> I keep coming yes. back to it but it's because it's like that's what's different about a book um that's what makes a book different and I love what Naima was saying in terms of yeah, it, it's that personal intimacy you do feel like you have when you love a book so much. You feel like, and that's the, one of the sweetest feelings is when you read something in a book alone and you're like, oh, I thought that was just me. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> it is so special. And the, and the funny thing is everyone has those moments, but we all think it's just mm-hmm. us. And that yeah. is magical. You're like, oh man, girl, this was like, she wrote this like 300 years ago, but she knew that it in was 2021. Like, <laughs> yeah. she knew it was about me. And I think those things are so sweet and that can't really happen in the same way. I, mm-hmm. I think it, it's a very special thing. It can with other art, of course, but it's something really special, obviously, about a book. And this business is way, way is way too hard just in general and it's really hard to be a black woman in this business and I would not yeah. be doing this at all if I didn't believe it and love yeah. it and love doing it immersing myself in it all day every day pretty much so yeah I mean it, it goes down to like it, if someone can sense that you don't believe in it you, you <laughs> they're like well wh-, you know like you have to almost inform people how they should care about these things you know like you really do have to do that legwork um publishing is a business like I I have to always tell people because I think it gets romanticized a lot and I worked in publicity for um a romance imprint um and it was is it was really tricky I mean like I can't really imagine you know but I I do have to like tell people, you know, I have to like temper their expectations of what the publishing industry looks like, especially right now. Like, it's just, right. it, I always tell people, I'm like, it might as well just be like any other, I mean, it's, it's capitalism. Like, <laughs> like, do you have enough time to talk about capitalism? Um, yeah, it's but, troubled by all the things that yeah, trouble our society yeah. and world. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it's, um, you know, books get bought because, previous books like that get bought and it's it's hard especially when you want to write a different story you know like I think that's changing I think it's been changing in the last year or so I and I I really hope you know those books get to stand on the shoulders of another book shoulders um but I I think they're having a major wake-up call thankfully to know that like the status quo isn't um what people really want to buy anymore you know so yeah, and, and I think that I, I would add to that that that's exactly why no no negativity towards my book at all. So um, a, a, a bad review or, or someone just posts a beautiful picture of it on Instagram and it's just like, I didn't really like it. Um, those things are, I'm, my joy is completely untouchable because I know how hard it was to get here. If mm-hmm. people knew how hard mm-hmm. it was to be a black woman, not writing about primarily about race, of course I do write about it, but, but 
but yeah. I'm saying people knew how hard it was. Um, so this is me, you know, 11 years into the business. So um, a little, a, a little thumbs down or a little half star or something like it's completely, it, I'm completely untouchable when it comes to that, because um, I know how hard it is to get there. It feels almost impossible to be able to get here, especially when I look around and have just a handful of people I can look up to who have been able to do the things I wanted to do. Um, it, it's, it's, it's exceedingly hard. Um, it's a very, uh, yeah, it, the business is one, one, one part of it. Um, it's not always great. And, and to what you were saying, uh, yeah, I, I do hope that things get better. Now I'm not sitting here and being like, I think tomorrow things are going to be great. It's going to no. be really hard for a long time. <laughs> but, but the yeah. fact that they're talking about it, I guess, and listening at least a little bit, you know, we, you know, uh, I'm a black woman. So I, my faith in people doing the right things <laughs> doesn't, uh, yeah, it's not great. <laughs> but, um, you know, I feel yeah. very blessed to be able to be here and to do it. And um, I, I'm always leaving my door open, especially to young Black um, women who want to jump in. I, I do the DMs or emails, like I will tell them everything because so much of the business is shrouded in secrecy. And it's like, I will tell them everything, the numbers, my connections, anything. And so mm -hmm. that's one thing I do personally to, you know, to help. And then also, like I said, just being staunch about it, you know, um, just it, so with Whiskey and Ribbons, we went back and forth. It's a police officer is killed in the line of duty. And that's my first novel. And it happens in the first sentence. So it's not a spoiler. But mm -hmm. I remember talking to my publishers about that and whether or not we would include that he was a black man. But um, it had nothing to do with him getting killed. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. And I know how, and trust me, I know how defiant it is for me to write a story about a police officer getting killed about the police but it wasn't about his race at all. And so I defiantly am like, that just doesn't need to be, it just has nothing to do with the book whatsoever. Yeah. So much so that the people creating the audiobook thought that my characters were white. Now they thought yeah. that because I didn't say on the first page that they were mm. black. We just assume every person in the book is white until someone tells us they're not. Um, and, and I don't feel like I owe, I don't have to tell you that in the first sentence. You can flip to the back, see my picture and, figure it out, you know, but those kind of things, it's like white writers aren't asked about. They're not tasked writers. with that. They're, they're not, not tasked, tasked with that. Like they, yeah. you know, um, yeah. The assumption that if you don't say someone's race point blank, people assume they're white for white reasons. <laughs> right. You know, I don't, I, but of course other people No, do. but it's, yeah. um, it's a thing that I don't think people get checked super often. Like, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, I've seen a lot of books lately where there are like, you know, white passing characters. And I think when they get to live in that space, it's even more complicated, I think, for white readers to understand, like, there's a lot more nuance to this than you realize, you know, and there's a lot more that you're assuming um, that, you know, I, like, have you guys read, um, oh gosh, it's a uh, Brit Bennett's The Vanishing Half. Yeah. Um, I think she plays a lot like, and, and uh, girl, woman, other, they play a lot around with uh, like white passing characters and what you, and I, I, it checked, it checked something for me, you know, as a reader who's, you know, there's one character in one of the books where you, you assume that she's white, but the whole, you know, that, that character doesn't know that she has a black background. Like she has no idea. Like she finds out like, sorry, spoiler alert, but it's this breathtaking part in her book where um, this character doesn't realize that she's, black like she has no idea because she was raised by white people and she has no idea like the lineage of her family mm -hmm. up until that exact point um and I was I've been thinking a lot about it too like when a black author writes a book it just gets relegated to like this is a story about race but the same is true of white people like a white a white person talking about white people is also a book about race like it's just it can't be entangled from that and I, I'm hoping we get to that point where we can now read you know the work of white people and understand that those are books about race just as much you know and the same as the opposite of black writers where it's like this isn't a book about race you know like in the way that we think it is it doesn't have to be you know purporting anything well I would say even Naima's book of course there are issues about yeah. race but mm -hmm. But but also Naima, I don't want to speak for you, but I don't think you sat down at the top of the page. You said this is a book about race. Tippity tap tap tap. It, of course, it comes <laughs> into 
of course it comes into their experiences um because yeah. it you know, because this is earth but yeah you 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 speak to that please yeah well it's as much a story about race as it is about gender right and about Family. geography yeah. it's like and and like race is certainly a part of the fabric of these characters lives as it is mine and it's interesting and troubling to see the way that gets like turned up or turned down. Yep. Um, yep. And I don't think either way is like, is, <laughs> is good. Um, you know, like eliding the issues of race so that it could be more palatable or turning it up because some people think we might be having a moment of mm-hmm. public mm-hmm. reckoning with race. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's been interesting to see people discuss my book and write about it because we were talking before about what readers bring to the text. And I can see like misconceptions um, come out in the way people talk about the book. Like I've heard people say, this is a book about two families, one black, one white. And it's not quite true. It's not quite true. Like there's a a family of a, a black mother and her son. And then there's another family with a white woman who marries a Colombian man. Um, and everyone said, and all the children are white passing. And one of them is white presenting, like one of them is, but it's been interesting, even just how much we long for shorthand, like, oh, one black, one white, all the children white presenting. Um, And even that sort of being not the only thing that differentiates these families, although it certainly shapes their experience of this town and this school system. Yeah. So it's Mm -hmm. just been sort of interesting to see people, I'm like, oh no, but like what the book is partially about is mixed families and asking questions about like what is whiteness like what is Latinidad is being white presenting the same thing as being white like what is race is race the body in public like what of ancestry what of all these questions and then people are like want two families one black one white it's it, it comes to I mean it, it it comes back to like people want to be like oh I've read something similar to this before how can I you know make this feel familiar to me so that you don't have to do the work. You don't have to do the legwork to understand that this is a completely different book than that. Mm. Um, yeah, people, people can't sit with uh, discomfort <laughs> finding either if they don't get something immediately. I mean, it's like, it's like what Lisa was saying, like if you don't understand something, go back to the front, read it over again. Like it's, it should be a, something that unfolds to you. You shouldn't be spoon fed. Um, Yeah, and I think that that's one of the gifts of a book, frankly, that like our discomfort or our joy or our pleasure reading a book is like vital information to us about like who we are, you know? Like if you read Lisa's book and you want to encourage Tally and Emmett to like lie to each other or like tell the truth to each other or make out or whatever, like that's some that reveals something about <laughs> you, you know? And I think that that's one of the gifts of books. Like when I read a book and something sits with me wrong um, or I delight in something, that's also, it's a way of coming to know myself and spending yeah. time with myself. And sometimes that's painful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I just want to say I wanted them I wanted Emmett and Tally to make out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Me too. I mean, I, I, no spoilers. To make out. Yeah. I mean, I've got to be totally honest with you. I mean, that's what's always get me to the page. I'll write a whole <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the fun part for me is the hidden the hidden romance. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You start to read my books, you're like. He's gonna want these people to make out. They're like, yeah. you're right. <laughs> Let's play with that. Let's play with that tension a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I know. Uh, a thing that I have tasked myself with at the bookstore is like elevating the romance genre out of just chiclet. And I don't think mm-hmm. it's chiclet. And I've I've had this running joke where I'm like, can we make like a dicklet section <laughs> like with male authors just to like prove a point? You know, like to put a lot of yeah. books in there. Like a lot, yeah. Of every every one of the books, like a yeah, yeah. Every yeah. one of these men who are like revered for, you know, so you'd have these people like Hemingway and yeah. James Salter, and they would be mm-hmm. in in that. Yeah, I, I think it. also like it's so it's so wild how huge things are reduced like that. Like especially when I think about Outlander, they'll be like romance, <laughs> and I'm like, really? Because I just read <laughs> 700 pages about you know Scotland and all yeah. of their history and what. Like I'm not just reading that for the romantic part. 
charts. Like that book is yeah. like a thousand pages long. And there are like what nine or ten of them now. But yeah. they'll just be like, oh, it's just romance. And I'm like, really? time travels. You're glossing <laughs> over so many things. And like we we kind of me and um manager, our manager Shannon, we went back and forth on being like, do we separate romance? Like, do we separate yeah. these books? And mm. at what point do we consider something, you know, romantic enough to put it on its side, you know? Right. Mm. Um it's been an ongoing conversation of just like how much romance in a book relegates it to another section of the story. Right. And what point do we put in like, you know, literature? It's tricky. Mm, so yeah. Yeah. I think that goes back to like, how do we, how do we think of these books and what does it mean about us when we like a book? I love romance. Like I love it. Yeah. I think there's something really, really fun about it. Um, yeah. We're a very unpretentious bookstore, which I think is really, you know, it doesn't it's happen super great. often. I know I've, yeah. I've worked at three different bookstores. This is the least pretentious one I've worked at where, you know, you're like, okay, no, it's okay. We don't need to whisper about where you want to go. Like, we'll show you. <laughs> like, it's fine. <laughs> um, I do have a question just because I, I watched these, or no, I read these and I felt like I was watching, like I could see these play out in film. Did you have like, do you have like a wish list of like who you would cast in these? books like if you know if Netflix you know emailed you <laughs> and they asked you for ideas on who to cast I always feel like it's fun to see who you'd cast I I don't know who I would cast um yeah. I think it would be fun casting because for the children in the book they're both children and then later adults so you get to double cast um I I wish I had like a better answer but I try not to have any particular person's face mm -hmm. or like features or mannerisms fully in my mind when I'm writing because that feels like feels limiting and I want to mm -hmm. be able to um, have a sense of who they are like they're vivid to me but they're more like presences than like Amy Adams and like yeah. Idris yeah. Elba and like yeah. whomever else <laughs> Oh um, no, I'll take Idris Elba for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was gonna say, like, I have, I have no problem, you know. Yeah, I have, that, that's what I was going to say. And I, I have no problem. Yeah, sometimes I just like to picture his face for fun. It has nothing to do with my writing. <laughs> it so, sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> so I do love that that was my only one that I did have, like, kind of locked down. And so you just, if you're watching this. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Definitely. We've got a role for you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sally has an older an older brother who just is like this just really this Leonine like this huge presence of a man and that was always eat yourself but in my head I would be okay with that I guess so I should say like <laughs> if he decided to do it I would be just fine with it but uh, like Naima I don't um and sorry I didn't know if I interrupted no no you, no Naima. no you're good I um I do, I don't have their presences to me too. And last time Naima and I weren't in conversation, she mentioned that. And that's exactly how I feel. I can see Tally in my head. I can see Emmett in my head. Um, I can't, I, I can't draw at all. I can't render them for you at all, but I can, but I can see them, but they're not based on any people. And so that's what happens to me in all of my books. So yes, if Netflix were to call and, and, and let me run the show, which I'm sure happens all the time. Oh, totally. <laughs> But yeah, Another I can, misunderstanding I can... about the business. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you just write the book and then Netflix calls you. Isn't that how mm -hmm. it works? Yeah. Um, but then I would, um, yeah, I, I could totally see where I, I would see where a lot of things wouldn't work as opposed to the things that would work. I think there could be a, you know, a wide, you know, a, a huge array of ways they could go. I would only be like, that won't work you know so mm -hmm. but it's a that is a fun thing to do I have a Pinterest board where I save pictures yeah. of clothes and you know especially because Tally's home is such a big deal in the book so pictures of houses that are super cozy and spaces that are cozy I do that but that's really just for fun I don't need that mm -hmm. but I end up using it I'll give it to my editor when it comes to us discussing the book cover and stuff like that so I do end up yeah. using it in a small way but um but yeah, it's not a huge part of my writing, even though I do have to picture them in my own head so I can describe them. But I like to leave a lot of it open because so the reader can, you know, even when people come to me and they're like, I always pictured this person, I'd never correct them. They can, mm -hmm. I can't yeah. control what they're 
making. Yeah, they can, you know, so I'll, I'll leave it pretty vague. Like, oh, she has hair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Her, her eyes were right there on her face, you know. <laughs> and then the person she can, can, can this, she did, she really did. And so it's like the person can kind of fill in if they want, because it's a fun, such a fun part of reading. And then I think that's why people, I don't think I know, that's why people get so angry when their books are, are cast because they'll be like, mm. He didn't look like that in my head. And I'm like, well, that's oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And that, that makes people just pan the whole thing. They're like, the book was better. And I'm like, they can be two different pieces of they art. Are. Like, yeah, they are. Things. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. People get so upset. <laughs> you do. I do want Michael B. Jordan. Like, I see him as like Ray. Like, I just, Aww, I would, but I, I also would just, I just have, have a cast. crush. I have such yeah. a crush. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I would not be, I'm not mad at that at all. No. Nope. Yeah. I'm sure <laughs> seeing him like make an pies, excellent job. I, like, yeah. I yeah. Can see it. <laughs> yeah. An early morning in a bakery with Michael B. Jordan. Yeah. Um, it's my dream date. <laughs> I'll, I'm putting that into the universe. Yeah. Put it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. And I kept, I kept hearing, uh, Margarita, like I kept hearing her voice. Like I couldn't see her, but I could, I could hear her voice. And it reminded me of Alexis from Schitt's Creek. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't, but... although all my friends are obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah. I just could see her like on her phone, just like kind of half amused with people. I really, I really enjoyed Margarita. I just, she, Thanks. man, she, <laughs> She felt very like true to form, but if you ever watched Shit's Creek, I just I heard Alexis's voice when I yeah. when I read her. So well, she's very dear to my heart. She's one of Lacey May's three daughters, but she she is a chapter in the book from her perspective that was almost cut from the <gasps> novel. Um, no! I, I advocated to keep it. Um, so you know, Margarita grows up to be to attempt to be an influencer, and I think that maybe you know her story can feel like frivolous because she's caught up in all these things that are pretty easy to look down on, like being an influencer, social media, she drinks, she parties. But with her, I was thinking about like how we try to escape our pain or like turn down the volume on our pain and the different things that we turn to, um, which I think is not an uncommon uh, desire or longing. And so I love that she still, she got her chapter and I, I won that battle. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I really, I really love that too. I, I was gonna, yeah, go ahead. Oh no, no, go for it, go for it. Oh yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Like she's also really, um, really feminine, and I love that, like that, that bubble gum, you know, like California, like thing. Yeah, came out like unabashedly. Um, I would be stoked to see all the Paris stuff um from your book on the screen too because it's just one of my favorite places in the world probably my favorite place in the world so mm -hmm. I'd always um, my next book is set in Paris um Ooh. just because I want to spend more time there and I can't go right now but yeah so it's my favorite so do you have uh, a yeah. title Lisa for your next book and are you able um, to share next, yeah my next book that's coming out next uh, spring is called a half-blown rose and it's set oh, um, in wow. Paris yeah I like that Ooh, okay. It gives me a vibe already. <laughs> yeah, I'm Good. excited to read it. Yeah. Was it, so I'm, I'm so fascinated by titles and how people go through um, so many different titles. Maybe you didn't go through any, maybe, you know, it just jumped out at you, but was there, what was the path towards finding your titles? Cause I, I, I could not name your books any differently, you know, like I couldn't think of another name for either of them. They work so well. So well, that's interesting because I could think of a different title for my book. I had a different title um, in mind. I wanted to call it Didn't Never Know because I liked Ooh. how tangled that was. I liked that it was like idiomatic and had a double negative in it because my book is so much about what people don't know or can't see about themselves, about each other. Um, but my publisher was like, that is too hard to say and remember. <laughs> Um, and so my title, I didn't come up with it. My editor came up with it. She came mm -hmm. up with what's mine and yours, which is a riff off a line from measure for measure, which is the Shakespeare play that is staged in the newly integrated school. And she did a good job. Like she did a great <laughs> job. I'm not very good mm -hmm. at titles. I struggle with titles and it's a great title for the book because it, you know, gestures at 
all the things that we want to hold in common, but how there are still sometimes divisions between us that feel uncrossable. So I just have to give credit where credit is due. Like it was not me. It was my editor, <laughs> Seema Mahanian, who's very good at her job. Like <laughs> very good at her job. Yeah. Oh, Seema. Thank you, Seema. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I really love the title, This Close to Okay, because it just the book is a process. Healing is a process. Life is a process. Being a human is a process. And I really felt the, the title, This Close to Okay, you know, people trying trying to get there trying to get close to okay um I have I do I did have another title originally that is a secret because I want to use it for something else but I, I, I do love you know I love that too and I can usually titles usually will come to me at the beginning but you know so of course sometimes they change but yeah I'm really pleased with this one because yeah it's what the book is about I don't think that you I think that you see the title and then you get to the end of the book and you'll be like oh yeah it makes sense <laughs> Yeah, it, it it informs you know what you're going into and how you end it too. Like I just I like the thought of titles um, informing how you write it and informing how you end it, and yeah. how people read it. So I just feel like they both did that really well. But yeah, I have so enjoyed talking with you both. Um, I want to be you know respectful of your time, but I just wanted to thank you so much for participating and talking with me about your book. This was a lot of fun. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you, Greensboro Bound. Yeah. Thank you again for joining us for 21 Conversations. If you enjoyed this presentation, please like and share with your friends and fellow readers. One final reminder that Greensboro Bound is a nonprofit organization committed to bringing together readers and writers throughout the year at zero cost to our community. Please help Greensboro Bound maintain that commitment with a sustaining or one-time gift now. The number to text to give and our website are on your screen. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in person next year.